Welcome everybody to Bright Insights Digital Health C-Suite Series. I'm excited today to have our guest, Anita Pramoda. Anita has an amazing background. Um, just as a quick highlight, she's CEO of Owned Outcomes, a health analytics software company. She also serves as a chairperson of the board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Um, she's also on the board of Health Catalyst uh, and Go Health. Um, also really impressively, uh, before all these roles, Anita was a, the longtime CFO of Epic Systems, um, the nation's largest uh, uh, EMR electronic medical records company. Um, Anita, great to have you with us today. Thanks for joining. Uh, thank you, Cal. Excited to be here. Yeah. Let's just jump right into it, Anita. Let's talk about your uh, experience and longstanding role uh, at Epic, where you know, you were. Um, you know, the CFO there for many years, as I mentioned, given the time and experience that you had there, I would love to hear your views on data integration and the importance of how do you integrate data across systems uh, and, and how that view has evolved over time from your early days of Epic to, you know, the digital health work that you're uh, helping companies drive today. Kel, that's a very fair question. Uh, you know, Epic was started by Judy Faulkner, and the first slide when she introduces Epic to everybody uh, is a slide with the, a child with flowers, and she says this is with the patient at the heart. So the data models are in and around and wrapping around the patient, right? And, uh, you know, we, we all are patients. We have parents that are patients. We have neighbors, children uh, who are all patients at one point or the other. And so we've learned over the years that then healthcare is also a team sport because we've created so much knowledge and so much opportunity for depth and specialization from our care team that uh, then, you know, these people have to be able to wrap around us and bring their own individual areas of depth and expertise to give us the best possible outcomes. Uh, and that so if healthcare is a team sport, then data must be ubiquitously available to everybody that is on the team. It needs to be available without latency, without friction, uh, so that they can have the benefit of all the information that's relevant to them and give them their best expertise. Yeah, let's talk about our customers that you just referred to. You know, they're, they're, as you know, pharmaceutical and medical device companies. And as they're innovating with digital health products, you know, we really talk to them about to have successful adoption, you need to really integrate into the clinical workflow, right? You need to integrate into the workflow of the provider. And that workflow, you know, that cockpit, if you will, is typically that, that EHR. Um, any practical advice, let's say for a pharma company that's building a connected inhaler, that's gonna be collecting really relevant data for that physician uh, when they're you know, assessing and, and making clinical decisions for that patient. How do you think about that data and getting it into the workflow of the provider. In healthcare, we also have to remember that manufacturing and insight is not the answer. It is solving that last mile problem, which is helping the physician, because ultimately the greatest uh, trusted relationship in healthcare is between the doctor and the patient. And every unit of goodness that will be delivered to the patient will be delivered through that doctor, right? Uh, when, when you talk about this, the benefit of this intervention, and so that then bringing that to the point of care, because I mean, doctors are in the business of saving lives, right? Uh, they they ha they are expected to work under the most difficult of circumstances. Every interaction, every day, is in the gravest moments of a patient's life, in their most anxious moments when they're making life 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 and death decisions. Uh, things that are truly life altering. And this is the circumstance in which our doctors meet their patients, which means they're not thinking about technology. They're thinking about how do I deliver the best of my expertise uh, to, to this person who is in pressing need of my help, right? Don't add another layer of cognitive burden. Don't expect them to perform one incremental task that's outside their muscle memory because just about all of the tasks that they do must be muscle memory and the only thing that they're like they, they are running on overdrive is their cognition, right? Their clinical judgment. That's 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 the role that they play. That's the circumstance in which they practice what it is that they do, which means that integration becomes that much more critical. Let's spend a, a minute on the data side. You, you know, you spoke earlier that at Epic, you, you, that you guys obviously um, uh, take very seriously and think deeply about you know being the custodians of of, of the data record there. Um, and you know maybe you didn't think all the way through to the second, third, fourth order 
um, you know, opportunities of what you can do with that data, uh, but, but you have that fundamental you know, alignment to it. You know, in biopharma, you know, historically, we've seen that industry actually be really hesitant to capturing patient data in, in the commercial environment, in the real world environment, like outside of the clinical trials. In fact, it's hard for me to actually think about an industry that's actively tried harder to know less about their end users in the biopharma industry, as, as crazy as that sounds, right? Especially in the data-driven world we live in. Um, I think that's beginning to change in pharma, but be curious from your vantage point where you're working with so much of the healthcare value chain, you know, where do you think healthcare really is in terms of viewing data as an asset versus data as a liability that they need to worry about having and protecting? That's a, that's a very fair question, right? I think your criticism is a fair one. I'll start by acknowledging that. Uh, however, I uh, equally along with that, I want to I want to present that number one, data has been a liability. It has been incredibly burdensome uh, from a legal perspective, with riddled with all sorts of confusion. So that's one. Second is biopharma has uh, for they've done such good work over the decades and have enjoyed such little credit for it in some ways, right? The press has painted them badly, the, the regulations have painted them badly. There's, there's just any number of people that haven't seen them as the partners in care that they deserve to be viewed as, right? And so, which means just a liability becomes magnified, right? Which means it represents any data suddenly represents, okay, one more reputational hazard because I get slapped in my wrist for every time something goes wrong. Uh, and uh, and so that's, that's the second uh, sen sentiment that I bring to this. And then the third one is technologically, Cal, they, the tools haven't been available in a usable format. Remember the core of their DNA is not data handling. It is science, it happens in a wet lab, right? What makes a biopharma company spectacular and what kind of, what makes new therapies happen is the magic that happens in a wet lab uh, as opposed to the magic that happens on a keyboard, right? Uh, so it's a little bit of a transition for them and for them to successfully make the transition. One is the base technologies need to be available. Yes, they have to, uh, you know, add to the talent density. And also then the ecosystem has to emerge where the tool vendors including yourself have to make platforms where they can actually lean in and make this easy for them uh, so they shouldn't have to develop computer science expertise to build a stack what is reasonable to ask them to do is to say i will build the stack for you you come in and you can engage with the stack and start manufacturing insights right so it's fair to say you are in the new world you have the opportunity to apply your domain knowledge uh, in on top of this digital data and manufacture digital insights. But to enable you to do that, I built out an entire sp uh, stack for you, a technical stack for you, uh, that you've, you've suddenly put them in a place where that transition is more, much more real as opposed to somehow I'm gonna start from scratch, everything above an operating system I'm gonna do myself, or I'm gonna buy a database and see if I can become a world-class systems integrator. That just was not possible for them. You know, in terms of how you actually operationalize tech-driven innovation in, in a biopharma or med tech company, how would you advise you know, you know, the, the C-suite, the CFO in particular, right? Because I think one decision we all often see is just this notion of, do I build most of the tech stack or do I partner uh, you know, with the external, uh, you know, uh, external folks uh, for, for that tech stack? Which, which, how, how, do, how do you frame up that advice? No, that's 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 an extremely fair question, and the natural instinct of many people is to, you know, cost the build versus buy in terms of the pure dollars and cents that go with it, um, and and uh, there is a time dimension that goes with it as well, uh, and and you know what is the value of getting to the market one year sooner? They know how to do that math. I don't need to tell them how to that, do that math. Where I think I might have something useful for them to think about is in two parts. One is uh, this issue of uh, risk, right? Uh, what is the likelihood that you can pull this off and if you go wrong, what is the business cost of going wrong? And suddenly you see some asymmetry, a meaningful amount of asymmetry in do I, uh, you know, the, the marginal cost of 
partnering is so low compared to the upside of getting it right and de-risking that innovation process and gaining a certain amount of market leadership on the medtech or the biopharma side. Uh, that is where I would encourage them to put a lot of a uh, lot of the brain power and attention towards and once they're oriented that format then then it's the asymmetry becomes very obvious to the extent they choose incredibly partners the second thought that i have is on the topic of talent density right uh, talent when it goes back to you know it's the chemistry and the uh, the fluidics and the electronics and the uh, mechanics of the engineering that it that you need all of those competencies and that was that's what made you a world class uh, med tech company uh, or a biopharma company. What is adjacent to that is uh, you know the data science in and around those areas. What is not adjacent and the distance is so far away in competency is building a platform and ma managing each one of these integrations yourself. And uh, that, so to acquire and retain talent in an area that someone else specializes in often is much harder than people think it is. And it's less of a financial decision. And so the recommendation I would have is partner with your talent folks to understand the real risks and the lead times associated with gaining this kind of talent as well as retaining them, engaging them and retaining them, and then thinking about their skills not going obsolete. Uh, and I, I'm, I often think there is a credible argument to be then very quickly made for, look, take a harder look at partnering because uh, you get to stand on the shoulders of people who do this, do this at scale and do this with specialization. Nita, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, with your, your expansive and, and deep background across so many aspects of healthcare technology, uh, healthcare data. It's been a fascinating conversation, super insightful. I certainly really appreciate it and I'm sure our viewers will as well. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Kel.